Hello and welcome to Bladder Cancer Clinical Trials 101, What You Should Know. My name is Stephanie Chisholm and I'm the Director of Education and Research at Beacon and I will be the moderator for this program. I'd first like to introduce our speakers for today's Clinical Trials 101 program and we're really delighted to have our great friends from MD Anderson here. We have Marissa Lozano, who is a research nurse, and Alice Abraham, also the research nurse supervisor from the Department of Urology at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. Marissa Lozano is currently a research nurse manager at MD Anderson Cancer Center's Department of Urology. She has extensive experience in the care and management of patients on clinical trials, particularly in urologic oncology. Marissa holds a nursing degree from the University of Barcelona and is officially certified as an OCN and CCRP. Alice serves as a supervisor for research nurses in the urology department at MD Anderson Cancer Center. She has hands-on experience with the management of patients on various clinical trials pertaining to urologic malignancies. She's a nursing graduate of the University of Texas and holds a CCRP certification. So I'd like to welcome you ladies. Thank you so much for joining us on this program. Thank you. Thanks. I'd also like to take a moment and thank Genentech and Merck for their support of the 2016 Patient Insight Webinar Program. This is our way of reaching out to patients directly and bringing the experts right to you. And we do appreciate the support that we get to be able to do this program. Thank you. So ladies, I'm going to turn it over to you. If you just self-introduce so everybody knows your voice, that would be great. Thank you, Stephanie. This is Alice Abraham. Hello, everybody. So I'm going to jump right into the question, what exactly is a clinical trial? Clinical trials are part of clinical research and the heart of all medical advance. Clinical trials are designed to answer questions about new treatments or ways of using existing treatments better. There are currently 156 bladder cancer studies all across the United States actively recruiting patients. And all the bladder cancer treatments we have today are a result of clinical trials. So let's look at a few potential benefits of participating in bladder cancer clinical trials. Each clinical trial offers its own set of opportunities and risks, but for the most part has some, some of the same potential benefits. By being a participant in a trial, you might be able to help others who have the same condition in the future by helping advance cancer research. By being a participant, you could have access to treatments that are not otherwise available, which might be safer or work better than current treatment options. You may increase the total number of treatment options available to you, even if you haven't had all of the standard treatments yet. You may feel that you have more control over your situation and are taking a more active role in your healthcare. You'll probably get a lot more attention from your healthcare team, which comprises of your routine doctor, your clinic doctor's nurse, and in addition, some study sponsors may pay for part or all of your medical care and expenses during the study. This is, isn't true for all clinical trials. Be sure you know who, to, who is expected to pay for what before you enroll in your study. Now comes the big question. Should I participate in a clinical trial? So there's always a degree of uncertainty when you're thinking about clinical trial participation. Part of the reason is that the doctors themselves in charge of clinical trials don't know ahead of time how things will eventually turn out. Because if they did, there would be no reason to conduct a trial in the first place. So the simple answer to the question, should I take part in a clinical trial, there's no simple answer. As a patient, there's no right or wrong choice when it comes to decide whether you want to take part in a clinical trial. The decision is a very personal one and depends on several factors, some of which include the benefits and risks of the study itself and what you hope to achieve by being a part of it. It also depends on your values, your preferences, your priorities, but bottom line is knowledge. Knowledge is key. Knowing all you can about clinical trials and your baseline health in conjunction with your medical doctors can help you decide whether or not to participate in a trial. If you do decide to take part, it is important that you know what to look for and what to expect ahead of time 
because this can be very helpful in helping you make your decision. Hello, this is Marissa, and I'm going to talk about the phases of uh, clinical trials. So um, clinical trials are conducted in a series of steps called phases, four of them to be more specific. Each phase is designed to answer a separate question. So for example, in phase one trials, the main question we are trying to answer is, is the treatment safe? In this type of studies, a new drug or treatment is given to a small group of people for the first time ever to evaluate its safety, determine if the dose is safe and how the new treatment should be given and to see how the new treatment affects the human body. In phase two trials, the main question is, does the treatment work? In this case, the drug or treatment is given to a larger group of people to determine if the new treatment is effective while still evaluating its safety. In phase three studies, the main question is, is it better than what's already available? In this case, the drug or treatment is administered to larger groups of people, usually we are talking about thousands of participants, to confirm its effectiveness, monitors the side effects, compare it to a standard of care treatment, and collect information that will allow the drug or treatment to be used safely. In phase four studies, the main question is, what else do we need to know? These are studies done after the drug or treatment has been marketed, and the purpose of the studies is to gather information on the drug's effect in various population and any side effects associated with long-term use. This is Stephanie again, and I'm just going to jump in because if you're interested in looking for a clinical trial, Beacon tries to make it a little bit easier to help you find those clinical trials. And so if you went to our website, www.bcan.org, you'll see a link to our clinical trials dashboard. It's a resource that's specifically for patients and physicians to help find current clinical trial listings for trials that are actually open because sometimes clinical trials may be listed, but they might not be open and actually recruiting patients. And so again, if you go to our website, you'll see the dashboard. Once you're there, you can actually search by disease state and sometimes even by zip code to be able to find a clinical trial that may be in your community. So that helps to make it a little bit easier for you to identify trials that might be convenient for you. But we're going to address some of the other issues about getting into clinical trials in just a few moments. Thank you, Stephanie. So uh, this is Marisa again. I'm going to continue talking about what you should know about clinical trials. And the reason I'm saying that is because when you are considering participating in a clinical trial, there are a few terms that will generally come up in the discussion and that you need to be aware of. What are all these terms? Um, it's, for example, the informed consent, the RRB, the eligibility that includes inclusion and exclusion criteria. So let's take a look at all of these. So the informed consent is a process through which you learn the purpose, the risk and the benefits of a clinical trial before deciding whether you want to join the study or not. It is a critical part of ensuring your safety. In essence, in the informed consent, you learn important information about the trial that can help you decide whether to take part or not. As I said, the informed consent document, which is a document that will be given to you at the time of the discussion, will typically include details about the studies, such as purpose of the study, the duration, and the required procedures, and who to contact for further information. The informed consent also explains the risks and the potential benefits. After you hear all this information, it's up to you and your physician, but mainly up to you, to decide whether you want to participate or not. I have to mention, and it's very important to remember, that an informed consent, it's not a contract. It's a document that you have to sign and bears a signature, but you volunteer sign on that document. In the same way you volunteer to participate, it's your will to withdraw consent at any time from the study 
if you decide to do so without having to give us any reason other than I don't want to participate any further in the study. There is also a term that comes up all the time when participating in studies in clinical trials. It's called the Internal Review Board, or IRB. An institutional review board is a group of people responsible for protecting the welfare of the people who take part in the study and making sure that studies comply with federal laws. They make sure the risks involved are reasonable when compared to the possible benefits. The boards are often made up of medical experts, such as doctors and nurses, other scientists, and also non-medical people or members of the community, usually from diverse careers and backgrounds. All of the people on the IRB cannot come from only one of these groups. In other words, an IRB could not be only a group of just doctors or just nurses. Many institutions have their own IRBs, but some smaller centers may use larger, what we call central IRBs. The Federal Office of Human Research Protections oversees the activities of all the IRBs. Researchers who want to start a study must first submit the plan that describes the study in detail to the IRB for review. The IRB must then decide if the study will be acceptable not only on medical terms, but also on ethical and legal grounds. Once the study begins, the IRB also follows its progress regularly to look for potential problems. If any of you take part in a clinical trial and you have questions or concerns about safety, you can always contact the study's IRB directly, and that number should always be provided to you in the informed consent document. Hi, everybody. This is Alice Abraham again. Another uh, term that comes up in clinical research is eligibility criteria. Based on the question the proposed research is trying to answer, each clinical trial clearly states who can and who cannot join the study. In other words, eligibility criteria are guidelines that clearly state who will be able to join the study and the proposed treatment plan. Common criteria for entering a clinical trial may include having a certain type of or stage of cancer, having received a certain kind of therapy in the past, being of a certain age group. Criteria such as these ensure that people included in a trial are as alike as possible. In this way, doctors can be sure that the results are due to the treatment being studied and not other contributing factors. Another important aspect of why we have eligibility criteria is because it ens helps ensure participant safety. Some people have health problems beside the cancer and that which could make the treatments worse in the study. We want to be sure that you're not put at increased risk by participating in the study. Also, you may not be able to join a clinical trial if you already have had another type of treatment for your cancer. Otherwise, the doctors could not be sure whether the positive results produced were due to the treatment being studied or as a result of an earlier treatment. 